Wilma, it is good to have you in the house of God today. Hear what the Lord says to you. Your road has been long, but my arm also is long, for it is not short, says the word. And I have carried you every moment on your road, even during those times, especially during those times when you wondered if I was there. Behold, says the Lord, I have not only been there, but I've always provided a way out. And even in your current trouble, I am carrying you out. We are not even gonna go over the mountain this time, daughter. I'm gonna shelter you in my arms and plow a hole right through the center of that mountain. I promise you it will not be as other times. It will not be as hard. Because you have come before me and you have said, Lord, we have done this so many times. And what you have not understood is that I was allowing others to see my face in your behavior. And it has happened, and so your trial has outlived its usefulness. Daughter, hold on, because I myself am taking you through. Dear Jesus, thank you. Thank you for this one, Lord, that comes into your house on a Friday night with such trouble surrounding her. God, you are faithful. In a world of information, Lord, we know very little except this, that you are faithful. Thank you for coming out on a Friday night. You can be seated if you'd like to, if you can. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 27. Uh, Mark 15 and Luke 23 also speak of what we're going to talk about tonight, which is the veil and the fact that it was torn. Uh, it's something that we know about, but I want to talk a little bit about it tonight. The veil in the tabernacle it was torn after, or right at the moment, when Jesus was crucified. We're going to look at the recollection of Matthew, however, like I said, in chapter 24. And we're going to find out why it's such an important event and exactly what it means to us. We pick up the story at the end of the crucifixion. We're going to start in verse 50 of Matthew 27. When Jesus says it is finished, something happened. The earth shook, the dead rose. Things happen when Jesus speaks. And I know that he is speaking over our lives, each and every one of us that are in here or that are listening by television. It doesn't matter where you are. When Jesus speaks and says a thing, it has been said, and he does not take that back. And what happened when the veil was torn is something that he's not interested in taking back. And we're going to find out why. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, he yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple, it was rent in twain. It means it was torn in two. From the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. It means they were torn. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city, and they appeared to many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, and they said, truly, this was the Son of God." A lot is going on in here, and it would be fun to imagine what it would be like if you had buried Uncle Bob two weeks ago, and now he's walking around, and he's saying hello to everybody. This happens for a few days. Uh, Jesus made sure that although it was all about him, he made sure to have many opportunities of the truth 
to stand firm and to stand tall. So if somebody didn't see him, they certainly would have felt the earthquake. If they didn't feel the earthquake, they certainly would have seen somebody that was dead that rose again. This is a life-altering, history-changing moment. And I think sometimes in Christianity, we discount that. I think sometimes we're just comfortable with the fact that Jesus died for us and that now we have this awesome privilege of knowing God and we kind of just uh, move around how we want to about half of the time. I want you to understand the impact of what happened. I want you to see how greatly God looks upon your salvation and the fact that you are not only redeemed, but he paid a price for you and I. He bought you with the blood of his son. But when the veil was rent, something happened. And it's a historical point. Josephus and other historians at the time, they all record it, that the veil was torn. And the significant part of the veil is it was 60 feet tall. It was 30 feet long. And the thing about the veil, if it was four inches thick, it was fine linen woven together, layers and layers with yarn, special yarn, silken yarn, something that could not be torn. If you and your imagination or me and mine would have thought to ourselves, well, it's like tearing a curtain, you know, is what we think it's a curtain. No, this was a substantial piece of embroidered fabric. It was four inches thick. It was made in specifically to where how the Lord said that it should be made. It had angels embroidered on it that looked a certain way. And in the Holy of Holies, when you went in, they even had up above in this 15-foot square area that was adorned with many things. If you looked up, you would see tapestries of angel embroidery hanging from the ceiling. And the Bible says that the priest could only go in once a year on the Day of Atonement. And you know the story. The priests, they had little bells on the end of their garments because if the bells stopped ringing or clanging and then they heard a thud, it meant the guy's dead. He didn't, you know, prepare well enough. And so they had to pull him out by a rope that was tied onto his waist or probably onto his ankle. The Day of Atonement wasn't a joke. The Day of Atonement, the priest had to meticulously and very, very carefully go through a certain process to make sure he was presenting himself to God. Now listen to me. He was presenting himself to God in an exact fashion. He had to wash a certain way. He had to do his hair a certain way. He had to wear certain clothes. He had to layer those clothes a certain way. There's incense had to be going about him, a lot of smoke, so that when the presence of God would descend, as he said he would, and he always did on the Day of Atonement, that the priest would not actually look upon the presence of God nor his face if it would show. There had to be enough incense smoke to where he wouldn't understand. He wouldn't see it. He could feel it, but he, he wouldn't be able to see it. And what I'm trying to let us remember tonight is that when that veil was torn, when Jesus said, it is finished, that veil ripped from the top 60 feet high to the bottom. It wasn't something that a man could grab from down below. It happened in an instant. It happened as the mighty hand of God came and tore the thing. God can do whatever he wants to do, and it surprises me how many good things he's decided to do for his people. When the veil was rent, he was saying, I no longer need a sacrifice. I no longer need you to brush your hair a certain way or look a certain way or do a certain thing. I would wear sweats, but I don't have the figure for it to church. The situation that we have here is sometimes people over prepare because they think that the Lord's in that. They think the Lord's going to do something special because they prepared so much. Although the Lord loves preparation and he honors it. And the Lord will always honor the price that you pay. Do not get me wrong. There is prices that have to be paid. My good friend died yesterday. I didn't particularly want to be here tonight. But the Lord said, I didn't tell you to come if your heart was broken or not broken. I told you to go do something. So here we are praising God in the midst of pain. Amen. In the midst of trial and turmoil. Amen. And that's the way that it is because when the Lord says to do something, he tears the veil in our life. The thing that's in the way, he rips it in half. The Bible says that obedience is better than sacrifice. Amen. And that's what we need to remember. Obedience is better than any sacrifice we could give the Lord. 
I remember Chuck. How many remembers Chuck? Chuck had been homeless for 40 something years. He came in and he'd been in here a couple years and he'd come to every Wednesday night. And I, re I remember uh, after church, he'd sit and he would say, well, I had missed that one part, you know, uh, I didn't write that down. Could you uh, say it again? Because I'm going to go to the dumpster and preach to the boys. And I said, okay, you know, and so we'd go over it a little bit. But I remember Chuck in the old bank. Remember that little room that the worship team would crowd in there and we'd have our pretend meetings and whatever. And we'd have the things for communion in there. And on one Wednesday night, I wish, I wish it was an artist and... I wish I could explain it fully. But I said, Chuck, why do you never take communion? And he says, well, I'm, I'm just an old drunk, you know. And I said, it doesn't matter if you're an old drunk. The Lord didn't say to come in your perfection. He said, come. He'd make you perfect along the way. You love the Lord, Romans 10, 9, and 10. You love the Lord. It doesn't matter that you're so messed up you can't walk it out. But, you know, you love the Lord. That's the thing. You believe Jesus rose from the dead. He said, I do with all my heart. He said, but I can't take communion. And I said, well, why not? And he said, because my grandmother always told me that if I did not quit drinking, I could never take communion and I would go to hell. I said, well, God bless grandmothers that come hard on the grandkids. I said, but Chuck, I want you to take communion with me tonight. He said, but what if, what if I'm wrong? I said, then I will take the beating. I'll take it. Whatever hit you got coming, I'll take it. If God's going to get upset with you, I'll ask him to get upset with me because I'm going to do this. I'm going to force you into it. I'm going to guilt you into it. And he says, well, I would love to take communion, but I'm afraid. I said, well, forget about all that. You just, let's just go. And you know, his hands were so beat up and filthy, dirty, filthy, dirty. And he held that piece of bread that had been dipped in that grape juice. And he held it up like this. And he could never get set free, you know, because of that guilt on him. And I don't know if it was my imagination or if the light was just shining just so. But I could see the filth in his hand and, and his other hand was shaking as he held this up to heaven. And he prayed the most beautiful, simple prayer over his soul and ask God to forgive him and ask God to accept this offering. And as he took communion and I took communion, we both began to cry. And do you know in that moment, Chuck got baptized in the Holy Ghost and Chuck quit drinking. That's when he started going into rehab. If, in case you wondered what the big turnaround was, it was communion in that old building in the corner. And here was a man who was so condemned by the world and by religion. And that's what Jesus did. He tore the veil from the top to the bottom. And he said, no man and no thing is ever going to get in the way of me and my child again. To Jew and to Gentile, to men and to women, to children. He said, the veil is torn. All ye who are able, come in. And he invited us in to his presence on that day. Turn to the book of Hebrews, would you? The temple was divided into two sections. It had the holy place, and this was a 15-foot square that no one could go in except the priest. And then it had an outer area where people were able to go in. When God said, I'm going to tear this, he tore it forever. The veil in, in the Hebrew means a separator, a divider, a screen of sorts. But I hope you understand it was not like any other screen. It was four inches thick, and it was made out of fabric that would be difficult to cut with a sharp knife. That's your God. The Bible talks about the veil being torn in the book of Hebrews, and I'll read some of it to you, but I, I think you should read that this week. The Bible says that the Lord wants us to obey him. And he says, if you... Love me, you will obey my commandments. You see, there's a kind of a people that will just say, well, I love the Lord and everything's okay and I can do what I want and he's going to always forgive me. And you know what? That is true. But it is not true for people that wander into this house. It's not true for you when you come in here. I didn't teach you that. I didn't show you that. I didn't live that in front of you. So you don't get to say, I can be a big spiritual rehab if I want to, and I'm sick, and I'm tired, and whatever. I'm not going to do the right thing because it's inconvenient. You weren't taught that way. 
And so you don't get to claim that for your life. That's the unfortunate circumstance that you have. And if you go to other churches, goody for you. You'll probably get off the hook on Sunday. But when you come in here, we have to completely do what the Lord tells us because the veil was rent. And Jesus said, it is finished. And when he said it's finished, what he was doing was putting himself in you in full power. Because John 1 says that the Lord gives full measure to those who he saves. When we are called the children of God, he gives us power to believe and to receive. That means our world got shook up. That means our soul was violently seized by the power of God. It's not fair for us to be saved and walk around indifferent. It's not fair for us to be saved and forget what we were saved from and decide that we're not going to put forth any effort for the kingdom and for the lost. You are supposed to be wandering around doing exploits in the name of God, according to the book of Daniel. And if we're so busy fighting ourselves and our attitudes and our addictions, we can never go forward and do the thing that God has called us to do, which is change the world. We find this throughout the book of Hebrews, Exodus, Leviticus. It's in Isaiah, 1 Kings, and along with biblical historians. The day that the veil was rent is a recorded day. It's a big day. It is not in dispute. And so you have to ask yourself, why would God do that? Why would he tear that veil? Why is that so important? Because he went to great lengths to do it. It's because he wanted you to know there was nothing between you and him anymore. He was saying, come on in. But I'm telling you tonight, what does come on in look like? It's a question I'm asking. What does come on in look like? We who have the privilege to stand before a living God, amazing, magnificent, almighty, and we stand in his presence, and what are we going to do about it? Are we going to be self-absorbed? Are we going to be worried about ourselves more than another? I remember when I was young, and I was one day, I, I had a, a friend of mine that we were both in our 20s, and she, want, oh, she was Greek Orthodox, you know. It's tough for Greek Orthodox to come into the Holy Ghost. And she wanted to get baptized in the Holy Spirit so bad. And, you know, it, it just wasn't happening for her. And so the pastor had called for people that wanted to receive the Holy Ghost to come up. And so I was praying for people with the pastor and a few other people. And I looked at my dear friend uh, and I said, you know, you can help pray. She goes, but I don't have it. And I said, but, you know, you want the Holy Ghost so bad. How beautiful of a prayer is that, that you're praying someone else gets it. And she would weep over the people and beg the Lord to give them the Holy Spirit. And, you know, she got baptized that day because of her giving heart, her loving heart. And I think that we come before the Lord so often because we can, and we forget. We forget what that actually means. The veil, it was shielding God from sinful man and shielding sinful man from a holy God which he could not handle. So every time you engage in willful sin, Christian sins, you know what I mean. The gossiping and the little murderous thoughts. The things that we go through and we say it's okay. The legal crimes. Those are still crimes against the cross. The Lord does not tell you you have to be perfect. And I'm not telling you that. But I am telling you to look at your life and find out what would offend the very presence of the living God. Because the veil was rent, but who's in there never changed. The presence of God still sits in there. And you walk in and out is the only difference. How often have you set aside your time to be with the Lord in precious still moments of his presence? Or do we just keep going and trying to make it all happen? I'm telling you, you can't make it if you don't sit down when you get into that place. You have got to sit in there and you've got to feel the presence of the Lord for yourself and understand what he's trying to tell you. The veil has been rent and we have to take advantage of that in fullness. Hebrews 7, 20 to 28 says that Jesus, 
He became a priest with an oath when God said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. Now, there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him. Because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once and for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priest men in all their weakness, but the oath which came after the law appointed the Son, who has been made perfect forever. Turn to Hebrews 9 now, if you would, 24 to 26. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again. The way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. But now he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. And I guess the question is, do we live such a powerful life that would reflect the fact that such a powerful sacrifice was made? Do our lives reflect that they are expensive? Could you stand? I remember when I first started traveling to preach, you know, when I left the legal field and all that. My kids were a junior and a senior in high school, and uh, I got home from a trip, and I, I was gone just on the weekends about every other week, and was working full time and then I was weaning off of that but what I'm trying to say is that one night the police knocked at my door you know you have to live in Kingsburg to appreciate this it was a policeman with my son and my son's car was out front his truck his hot truck was out front and he had my boy and my boy's keys and he looked at me and he said, I found your boy doing 130 down whatever street it was. He handed me the keys and he said, I trust you to do the right thing. I forget, Martin was gone, I forget where. I said, 130. He goes, yeah. I didn't give him a ticket. I know it's, you know, he was having a good time, but you can't do that. So I took the keys and I sat down and she had Cynthia come down and I sat there and I wept and I said I, I need you to understand your dad wants me to go and do what God's called me to do and I, and I want to do it but I will not lose my children I will not save somebody else's kids and lose mine God didn't call me to that and that's unscriptural so if you kids cannot behave, I'm quitting the ministry and I'll go back to law. And they cried and I said, no, no, you're going to have to. We're all going to fast and pray because as of right now, I quit. Because I can't be gone even for a day knowing you're not right with God. I won't have it. I won't have you being squirrely like that. And I'm out preaching the word. It's ugly. And they cried, and they didn't want me to quit. I don't know if it's because they wanted me to do the will of God, or they just wanted me to be gone. I don't know. <laughs> Nevertheless, we all came to agreement that they would behave themselves, and, and they did, and, and the ministry rebooted itself. I tell you that story because a high price was paid for your salvation. When the veil was torn, Jesus said, it's never going to be this way again it's always going to be free 
It's always going to be easy, and it's always going to be beautiful and powerful. You can come and ask me for anything. You're his child, and he, he did not expect you to pay the right to say that. He paid the right for you. And just as I told my children, I can't go do the work of the Lord if you're not right. Jesus, he stops his whole world when you're not right. And he says, we're going to just wait on you. And I'm going to help you along, but we're going to wait on you because I love you. The veil was torn. Everything changed. So don't take it lightly that you are able to hear God. Please do not take it lightly that you can walk in peace. And don't turn away when the Lord's waiting on you and he's waiting to hear from you. And you're busy and you're bothered. You're sick and you're tired and you're overwhelmed. Do not do that to the one who tore the veil. Body on a cross, his blood poured out.